All right, we made it, Michael. Here we are, Pat. This is good. Hey, yeah. before we dive in, I just want to tell you how thankful I am getting to know you better over the last, I think, nearly 15 years. Uh, I mean, sure, I knew of you and Dell at my days at Compaq in the mid-90s, and then we were actually a supplier to Dell when I was at AMD, but mm -hmm. it's really been great. I just want to thank you. Well, it's been great getting to know you as well, and uh, great having you here in Austin. Yeah, you know, I... I People who weren't born here in Texas say, you know, I, I got here as quickly as I could, and my first move into Texas was in 1995, but I've been here in Austin with my uh, three kids and wife since 2001, and it's been, it's been just, just wonderful. Greatest country in the world. Yeah. It really is. It really is. Look, we're even uh, cutting our own deals with the UK, so that's wonderful. So. Um, First off, I, I'm a voracious reader of history and I love biographies. And I, I read your uh, latest book. You've published two, I believe. Correct. Uh, win But Play Nice. I mean, play Nice But Win. Thank you. Okay. And in it, you know, it was great. It wasn't just all about business and, and what, you know, Dell Technologies and you have done in business, but you were also talked personally, right? It started off as, as you being kids. And in it, you know, said one of your jobs was washing dishes uh, at a restaurant. I also know you worked at a Mexican restaurant uh, as well. Maybe it was the same thing. But you started your entrepreneurial journey um, even before then. Is that right? Yeah, I guess you could say that. I mean, um, I uh, was always pretty curious, and fortunately, I had great parents that didn't quash my curiosity. Uh, and you know, I would, uh, you know, I was doing stamp auctions and sort of all sorts of things to, uh, you know, make money. Right. And and, and and I was really curious about business, and you know, my parents. Uh, didn't really talk about sports or uh, things like that. They talked about the economy. They talked right. about the stock market, the oil boom. You know, I grew up in Houston, and uh, I'd see all these big buildings going up, and you know, uh, that was what was interesting to me. So, um, you know, that was sort of the the primordial swamp that I grew up in. You know, kind of kind of seeing seeing what was going on in a in a boom town and seeing other entrepreneurs that had challenged the status quo and building new businesses. And I thought that was fun. You seem to have a track record of doing things, but then taking it to the next level. A lot of kids had, had paper routes where they would sell newspapers. But I think I remember reading that, that you would actually, you kind of made the correlation between uh, people who knew people coming into a neighborhood who would buy newspapers and those happened to be people that just got married. So can you talk about, just an example, you went to the courthouse and got documents on, on who might be coming to be able to sell to newspapers when you were young? Yeah, so I got this, I get this job, you know, when I, when I turned 16, uh, the, the um, sort of employment opportunities expanded quite a bit because I, I had a car. It wasn't a great car. My parents, you know, gave me this hand-me-down uh, old station wagon, but I could drive, you know, different places. And so I got this job in the summer, and essentially we would call random phone numbers and try to sell people the Houston Post newspaper. And um, I, I turns out I was pretty good at it, uh, you know. And and uh, what what I what I learned listening to all you know talking to all these people was that oftentimes when people bought the newspaper, they were moving into a new house or they were getting married. Okay. And so that kind of sparked the thought in, in, you know, in my brain, well, how do we find more people that are you know, moving into new houses or dwellings or getting married? And so uh, I sort of you know, asked a bunch of questions, rummaged around, and there were lists actually of people that had applied for mortgages that you could get, right? And so I said, well, let's, let's send them all a direct mail offer to subscribe to the Houston Post. So that worked really well. 
Then I figured out that, you know, in Texas, when you want to get married, you have to apply for a marriage license. Okay, and this happens at the county courthouse. And if you go to the county courthouse and you say, I'd like to see the list of all the people who applied for a marriage license, you know, they kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? You know, and, and, but then, then, they, then they, they say, okay, they bring back these enormous books that are like, you know, really, really big. And in the licenses, it says where they want the license to be sent to. Okay. Well, that seems like a pretty good address to send an offer to, to subscribe to the Houston Michael, Post newspaper. How, how old were you? 16. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Of course. So, so I figured, you know, jackpot, you know, it's like, okay. And, and uh, Houston was in uh, Harris County, but there were like 16 surrounding counties that the Houston Post delivered to. So I hired a bunch of my buddies from uh, high school and, you know, went out to all these different counties, got all those addresses, and yeah, it worked really well. I th I'm thinking right now, maybe what a lot of you in the audience are thinking, what was I doing when I was 16? <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think I was a busboy. Uh, after track, I would go and do this, but uh, the Dell Direct model, it, you heard it here first. It was, a, it was an early lesson in direct marketing, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, ton of initiative uh, early on. And by the way, re read the book if you can. It's, it, it's really good. But none of this made it easy to have a conversation with your parents that you were dropping out of college here, here at UT. Now, it obviously worked well uh, for you, uh, but can you talk about maybe some of the lessons that you learned uh, the hard way? Because I think you were 19 at, at the time. 19, yeah, I started the company in my freshman dorm uh, at the University of Texas. And, you know, I would say um, I learned all of them the hard way <laughs> by making them myself. And, and that's, that's kind of how you remember them. So, um, you know, I learned about the importance of a team and developing a team, you know, learned, you know, you got to surround yourself with great people, stay curious you know, always be learning. Uh, you know, I had, had a sense, but really learned that integrity and reputation are the most valuable things. And, you know, uh, it takes a long, long time to build them up and it's really easy to destroy. Um, I learned that, that uh, you can learn a ton from customers, staying close to customers, understanding what their challenges and problems and opportunities and unmet needs are. You know, that's really the wellspring of success. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the thing you learn the most is that failure is where you really learn. You don't learn from success, right? <laughs> and so making mistakes, iterating, trying things, experimenting, uh, you know, that was really the path to success, not anything else. Well, I mean, those are just such sage words. and. Uh, I'd be less than honest to, to, to say that, you know, I think it took me into my 40s uh, uh, to get there and n not pretending or, or knowing that you're not always going to be the smartest person in the room. I think some of your early executives that you hired, you were in your 20s and they were in their 40s uh, and 50s. And, and it's interesting, a lot of entrepreneurs today, uh, I, I think some of their failure comes from they, they're not reading the room, they're not getting a holistic view and bringing maturity and wisdom uh, into the conversation. So uh, kudos for you. It obviously worked out for you. It, it mostly worked out, yeah. But, but uh, you know, uh, we made a lot of mistakes and, and uh, I tried a lot of things that, that didn't work. Um, but I was really fortunate to be able to get a lot of great people to sign up with me on this grand adventure. And um, Austin turned out to be a great place to attract people to. I, I have to ask, you know, a lot of the things we, we read about you are your spectacular successes. Uh, but, you know, in the book, you even talked about things that, you know, you just learned the hard way. Can, can you give maybe an example maybe when you were younger where it, it didn't go the way that 
uh, you had wanted and kind of how you rebounded from that? Sure, you know, we were kind of talking about some of this backstage, but you know, today we're the leader in you know, infrastructure products, servers, storage, right. those kinds of things. Um, our first couple of attempts weren't very successful at that. Uh, we, you know, we had our own version of Unix. This is before Linux came about, and that turned out to, not to be such a great idea. Uh, you know, we spent a fair bit of money doing that. We, you know, our, our first attempt or two at developing servers wasn't nearly as successful as that other company down the road in Houston right. uh, uh, that, that, that we were trying to, to beat. Um, and, you know, we developed a lot of things that, that uh, were not really, you know, right, right on target. Um, and, you know, it also took us a while to convince customers to give us the permission to sell those more advanced products that, you know, that they were storing their critical data on. Um, yeah, and look, I mean, you know, we tried to get in the smartphone business, you know, that, that didn't work. Um, so, you know, in, in the book, I, I certainly talk about a bunch of those, those failures and learnings and, and, you know, when, when, we, when we talk to our, our team, you know, we often talk about don't try to do five things and get five things right. You know, try to do 10 things and get, you know, six things right. You know, it's okay to make mistakes. Just don't make the same mistakes over and over again. Learn from those mistakes. Do small experiments. Iterate. And, you know, when you're in a field where things are changing all the time, there's no playbook. Experiment, that's how you're gonna find the right answer. Uh, you know, nobody has the right answer, right? You gotta go figure it out. Well, one thing that I've, I've found, and again, I've been in and around Dell for over 30 years, uh, is you have this uh, incredible understanding of what your customers want. And I think sometimes I'll parrot this back to the press or on a CNBC appearance, which is Dell doesn't get into a business that, that where customers don't want something. You, your entry point into a market, your timing is really good. And, and I'm curious, how, how does that relate to uh, what you had learned or, or how was that, that skill honed? I mean, does this go all the way back when you're doing upgrades for you know, IBM ATPCs, knowing your customers? I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of just, you know, accumulated experiences. I mean, I remember going to Japan a lot in the, in the 80s. And, you know, they were developing things that were amazing, but nobody really needed them, right? right. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's, that's really cool, but it's kind of a waste. Uh, and so, you know, we, we sort of iterated into this idea of, you know, pragmatic innovation, and you know the customer can't always articulate what the, the future solution is, but they can usually articulate the pain or the problem they're having and they're trying to solve. And then you have all these ingredient technologies at the molecular level, you know, to different components and parts and things. And the magic is really finding the intersection of those. And you know, uh, you know, usually there will be some lead customers that have some problem of scale or performance or uh, you know, some use case they're, they're, they're trying to address. And you know, if, you're, if you're finding the right kinds of customers, there's gonna be 10 more like that, and a thousand more, you know, and a million more after that. But you have to be agile and flexible and, and, right. and continually adaptive because you're gonna get it wrong and just accept it, deal with it, and be able to, you know, change quickly and, and iterate. So one of the biggest milestones in, I think, you know, your personal history and Dell Technologies was going from a public company to a private company. I think it was one of the first times we, we had met right around that time. And, you know, just to give all of you a sense for where De Dell Technologies was, uh, if you had bought stock when it was public, I think you would be up 1,355%. And, 
and the thought of Dell Technologies, or Dell at the time, uh, going private uh, seemed a, a, little, a little odd, but when I transport myself kind of back there, it, it, it made sense, because quite frankly, uh, the street wasn't giving you credit for, for what your future could hold and what you did. Can you talk about what it was like and what it was like living it? I mean, the, your name, you founded this company, your name is on the masthead, and you, know, you went through a process that at one point, people were tr at least threatening to take your company away from you. Yeah, well, so uh, you know, I thought it was going to be a little more straightforward and easier, <laughs> um, and you know, effectively, uh, going private was a way of liberating the company and reinvigorating the entrepreneurial spirit, and you know, kind of accelerating a transformation that we were already on, but uh, we could kind of speed it up. And then you know, a bunch of interlopers showed up and it got way more complicated, difficult, personal, and it was uh, extremely difficult you know, period. And I explain all that in, in the book. But yeah, I mean, uh, there were awkward moments where I wasn't really sure if I was supposed to go to the office or not, talk, you know, talk, talk to the management team. Uh, you know, there was open speculation about other scenarios and, uh, you know, that was gut-wrenching, right, because of the uncertainty it inflicted on our team and our, and our customers. But we managed to get all through that. And, you know, look, I believe we're in an industry where the pace of change is only going to accelerate. It's a quicker dead, change or die kind of industry. Right. And, you know, major transformations uh, involve financial volatility. And, you know, public investors don't really like that so much. And so going private was a way of accelerating the transformation. And then, you know, a couple of years later, we got to the point where we were experiencing, once again, strong positive growth and, and uh, momentum. And so returning to the public markets allowed us to simplify the capital structure and, you know, the ownership structure. And so here, you know, here we are again. You had one person you could talk to uh, about this. Who, yes. who, who was that? That would be my wonderful wife, Susan. Yeah. yeah. And then listen, I'm a, sure, I'm a small time founder and a, and a CEO, uh, but I do know what it feels like to be isolated and not, and you know, he was running this company and he, he couldn't actually talk to his senior leadership for what ninety days or something. They didn't. You there, weren't... There, were, there, there were these. There were these awkward periods where you know, literally, uh, you know, some lawyer would call me and say, you know, well, don't talk to the management team for a while. And like, like, I, last time I checked, I'm still CEO of the company. Uh, that seems kind of weird. You know, don't don't go to the office. And I go, okay, well, this is before COVID. You know, but um, so. Um, Anyway, we, we got through all that. Um, and, and look, leading a company can be a, a, a lonely uh, job you know, to begin with. Um, you know, maybe sometimes there are other CEOs you can talk to or other people in you know, situations that, that you can confer with. But th this, this was a, a, a unique you know, set of circumstances and um, Turned out to be way more difficult, but we got all through that. And fortunately, the team stayed stayed with the company, stayed stayed with me, and we came out a lot stronger for it. Absolutely. Um, so you've seen a lot of transition, a lot of change. We talked a little bit about that, but I mean, you've seen uh, you know mainframe to mini computers, mini computers to XC to six servers, uh, PC revolution. Uh, tablets, smartphones, the intelligent edge, cloud computing, uh, social media. I mean, did, did I, did I, I'm sure I forgot one in there. I, there's a lot, yeah, for sure. There's <laughs> but, but you've weathered changes and there have been some ups and down. What do you credit to the company of, again, not just surviving, but, but you're thriving right now? What do you attribute that to? 
I would, I would really uh, point to the culture. I mean, it, it, you know, it's creating a great product is important, but it's really the thing that makes the thing that, 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 right. that uh, is important. And look, every organization exists because it solves problems that are important and valuable and unsolved by some other means. Yeah. And you know, if you do that, you continue to exist as an organization. You get to play again and, and help your customers. And uh, if you don't, then they just go do something else, right? So, so you, you, have, you have to keep solving those problems. And you know, that involves a lot of listening and understanding and empathy and really you know, uh, figuring out what those problems are and, and, and then uh, constantly reimagining considering all the factors, what are the technologies that need to be employed to be able to, to solve this problem. And so, again, I sort of go back to the culture. You know, we have the Power Max and the Power Edge and the Power Store and the Power Connect and, you know, Latitude and, you know, all, all, all XPS, all these incredible products and services. And we're proud of every single one of them, but it's really the, the culture that, allows us to create every single one of those things over and over again and do it better and better each time. Hopefully, if we do that, you know, uh, more, more customers will, uh, you know, uh, come, come our way and, and that's, that's our job, you know, <laughs> is to understand those, those future challenges and solve them. So South by Southwest is uh, technology, music, movies, and a couple other things. So let's talk tech, tech trends. I mean, which, right, which ones you happen to, you know, run a technology company. Let's dive into this. I mean, what, what's hot, what's not, uh, what type of investments are you planning to make in 24 and beyond? Well, Pat, you know, these days it's all about AI, right? <laughs> Can you believe uh, it? We made this far in it without talking about AI. I that was believe. intentional. No, I know. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, look, bringing AI to the enterprise is an enormous uh, priority for us. And uh, it's a big platform shift and it's just beginning. You know, we're in maybe year one or two of, of the, you know, big AI revolution. Of course, AI is older than my dad, you know, as an exactly. idea. Uh, and, you know, about 10 years ago, there were some big breakthroughs in machine learning where, you know, the machines could do things that humans were not able to do. But now this whole uh, breakthrough with large language models and, you know, retrieval augmented generation and other innovations that are piling on, it's, it's, a, it's really a transition, uh, you know, or, or, or a, a massive additional capability going from Com computing and calculating to cognitive power. Sure. And this requires new architectures, right? It's new compute, you know, new memory, new storage, new networking, new software models, models of all shapes and sizes, small, medium, large. Um, and, you know, it's amazing to see the rapid pace of innovation and you know, what's going on, for example, the open source community sure. uh, is, is, is pretty tremendous. So customers are figuring all this out. They want lots of it, and uh, we're in a great position to help them. And they also want to bring the AI to their data, not the data to their, to their AI. And so that's certainly, you know, a massive priority. And, you know, that's on top of all the things we're doing around modern data center and multi-cloud, Edge is a really big deal. Sure. You know, everything in the in the physical world is becoming intelligent and connected, and it's generating lots of data. Uh, then you've got you know how do you enable individual users with the right devices and the right experiences, security, uh, sustainability. How do we make sure we're not you know using uh, all the resources exactly. in the world and all the energy in the world, um, and so. Those are, you know, sort of, sort of the main areas that we're really focused on. Well, those make sense. And, you know, I'm excited about AI. For, you know, you, you nailed it. I mean, AI isn't new, right? The first AI algorithms were developed in the 1960s. And then we had this object recognition hit about 10 or 15 years ago that, 
you could determine, you know, hey, uh, show me a picture of a dog, you know, sitting uh, on a boat uh, on a lake, and or it could tell you uh, what was on there. And, and this next generation is truly exciting. I think most people right now just have an appreciation for what they, the consumer capabilities. But, but what's amazing is this, this is going to transform businesses. And I don't say that lightly, that's not a throwaway line. Uh, I, I think the last big uh, opportunity uh, out there was, was the internet, right? I mean, when's the last time that a technology, let's say even on the PC side, you had to have a new device, right? I put gaming and you know, creator workstations aside here, but I think we're at the beginning of a transition that, that not only is gonna make a lot of waves in, in, in the tech community, but, but also, also with, with people and, and corporations. And I'm, I'm super excited about it. And for what it's worth, uh, you know, we like to think that all the data is in the cloud, but you know, 75% of enterprise data is actually still on premise. Or, or on devices uh, and on the edge. And I talked, at, as part of my business, talked to a lot of your customers, and they're not gonna <laughs> shove all their data up into the public cloud, especially one of the biggest differences in generative AI is you're, you're mixing modalities of, you know, you're, you're putting CX data with ERP and SCM and PLM and financial data. Companies aren't, and governments aren't really excited to just give that up into the cloud where they might have to pay 3x uh, uh, ongoing, so it's exciting. Yeah, and there, there's you know, a big build out of clouds uh, you know, to, to do this in every country. Yeah. You know, when you think about what these models are doing in cognitive power, uh, you know, when you get outside the United States, they don't necessarily want the U.S. model, right, in all these countries, right? They have a unique language, unique culture, uh, and, you know, the same is true, you know, in, inside companies, right? They, they've got their own data. They want it protected. They want it secure. They don't want to share it with anybody else. They want it for their benefit and for right. their customer's benefit. And in many cases, they're under, you know, regulatory, uh, you know, or, or, or requirements to secure it and protect it because it is the most valuable asset you know, that these organizations have. So South by Southwest, movies, music, creativity, how do you see AI impacting creativity? And I'm, you know, a, a side note, Dell Technologies is a core supplier to the creative community, either in uh, workstations, uh, racked workstations, uh, or they're making movies, they're doing A lot of your favorite movies stuff. and TV shows, you know, sit C cinema, uh, uh, you know, gr graphics creation, you know, is obviously heavily uh, done by, by, by CGI these days. Um, so look, I, I'm a big technology optimist. I think it's gonna empower creators just like it's going to empower everyone else. And our industry, you know, has these waves of, uh, you know, technological improvement where something kind of emerges that might have been around for a while, but it sort of breaks through to a point where it can be used at enormous scale. And they almost always build on the prior waves, sure. right? And this one feels bigger, more important, and more significant than any of the, the prior ones. So, uh, you know, and it's happening faster, right? Uh, you know, the internet, right, uh, was pretty fast, but this, it might be happening 10 times faster. And, you know, in almost no time, we have like 5 billion people with PCs and phones accessing AI. So that's pretty cool. And if you think about this, the, the cost of having a cognitive superpower as your friend enabling whatever you're trying to do is approaching zero. Right. Right, and that's a really interesting thought experiment to say, well, what does that mean for education, for healthcare, for science, for any aspect of humanity? You know, anybody that tells you that they know exactly what it means, they're just making it up, right? <laughs> Nobody really knows. But I'm, I'm very excited about it and optimistic because technology's always been about enabling human potential, making us healthier, making us safer, 
making us more successful in everything that we're trying to do. And so, um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a big one, Pat. <laughs> it's got to be done in a thoughtful, responsible way. It's got to reflect our humanity and, you know, our, our own beliefs. But I am a big technology optimist, and I believe it's going to be enormous, uh, an enormous leap forward, you know, in all domains. I saw recent data uh, showing uh, poverty rates, uh, birth rates, uh, you know, essentially how as a world we've, through technology, we have lifted ourselves out of these things. And, and I do believe, I'm a technology optimist too, but I think that sometimes we don't, uh, we, we focus in on the negatives, not the positives. Uh, I like reading old news clippings of, of history sometimes, and I remember when elevators first uh, came out and the, the dangers, I think it was on the front of the New York Times, talked about the incessant dangers and nobody should get uh, in an elevator. Uh, early electricity, uh, the AC versus DC. Uh, so bicycles, radios, all these things much were, were vilified. Yeah, there's a there's a website called the uh, Pessimist Archive. <laughs> into that sort of thing. Um, not, I'm not a pessimist, but uh, you go on there. It's really funny to see the the headlines, um, you know, from from the past. Bicycles, you know, very dangerous. Very dangerous. Yes. And again, I think we're both saying that 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 conversation and debate uh, is good. Uh, some forms of regulation are positive, some just completely stifle it. And, you know, some of the AI regulation out there getting teed up benefits only the largest of largest uh, of, of companies. And, and we need to be very careful that we don't squash the innovators uh, in this, the smaller yeah, look, companies. I, exactly. I think you want to err on the side of encouraging innovation and encouraging the use of the technology Trying to slow it down, I don't think is is the answer, uh, you know. Um, and you know, anytime you have an emergent technology that's evolving super fast, it's it's a big challenge for regulators, right? Because uh, you know, if if you think about a regulation, you know, written let's say last year, uh, uh, you know, re regarding AI, and just look at the you know dizzying pace of improvement that, that's occurred, you know, in, in, in the last year, you know, it's going to be hard for the regulators to, to uh, imagine how fast it, it's evolving. So Dell Technologies has a birthday coming up, 40. Yep. And you camped, I, I guess, planted your flag in Round Rock, hence Austin. Uh, I have to ask you about this. Like, it was even smaller. It was smaller when you first got here. It was small when I got here in 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 '01. Uh, it's been quite an evolution. Has it all been for good uh, and positive? Yeah, I think so. For the most part. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, um, the Austin area has roughly doubled in size every decade for the last four decades. Uh, but I think it's kept a lot of its character and, and uh, you know, it's been uh, an incredible attractor of, of people and talent. And, uh, you know, but my optimism is not just about technology. Uh, you know, technology's played a major role in, in all the great things that have happened in the world and certainly here in Central Texas. You know, as you mentioned earlier, South by Southwest started just music. Right and then, it, then it went to film and television and now interactive, which is technology. And in Central Texas, you have this uh, great combination, right, of uh, innovative businesses, uh, you know, great university, 1.6 million college students in Texas, and you know, I believe that. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs go where their ideas can flourish and sure. are welcome. You know, uh, you know uh, talent goes where there's opportunity. Capital goes where it's treated well, right? 
And turns out Texas is a great place for that. Austin has been a hub of innovation. It's attracted the best and brightest minds, new ideas, new companies, and, and new opportunities you know, for, for organizations of, of all sizes. And uh, it's been fun you know, playing, playing a part in that uh, you know, with, with, with our company um, and also with, with our foundation that my wife and I started 25 years ago doing a few things around town. Yeah. Um, Much more to come on that in the future, by the way, but we're off to a good start. And look, the last 40 years have been amazing, wonderful, exciting, but I think it's all just a pregame show, Pat, for what's to come. Uh, you know, when, when, when I think about you know, the, the, the future role that technology will play in, in the world, I think about the incredible innovations that we're already starting to see in, in healthcare, driven by technology, and as we, as we use all this cognitive power and we sort of explore the uh, you know, uh, unsolved mysteries of, of, of the universe, you know, maybe with the combination of, of quantum uh, you know, uh, technology, wow, what a, what a, you know, there's never been a better time to be alive, right? I'll hear here on that one. Where do you see Austin in 25 years? What, what is a, if, if you could paint that picture, what, what would it look like? I mean, we have three 60-story buildings being put up a, a block away from here. Uh, people are, are moving in here. Neighborhoods are being transformed. We're also moving outside of the city. Uh, healthcare is becoming more accessible. In fact, uh, your name is on an Adele Children's uh, Hospital. But but what does it what does it look like in twenty five years? I think it's going to continue to grow. I mean, you know, uh, will it double? You know, every decade. You know, for the next three decades, I don't really know. Maybe uh, we we certainly have land in the in the broader area to to do that. Uh, and, and look, I mean, if, 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 you, if you think about just the, the overall country, uh, you know, populations have been moving south and southwest for quite some time. You know, people have been migrating to, to Texas. Texas has been a very friendly environment, uh, and that's why all this migration is happening. That's why all the growth is happening. Um, but... I'll, I'll, I'll say another thing, you know, I, I think the, the importance of the University of Texas and the other universities in Texas, um, you know, really can't be overstated. If you find great companies, there's always a great university nearby. There's no place in the world where that doesn't really exist. And so continuing to have that uh, incredible, you know, uh, educational resource and uh, you know, protecting the natural beauty of the place um, and, you know, finding that, that, that right balance, you know, uh, between, you know, growth and development and, uh, you know, uh, livability and, and, you know, all, all the things that, that make a city great and wonderful, all the things that, you know, I loved when I first came here, you know, a little over 40 years ago. Um, a lot of those things are still there. You know, it changes as it grows, but also that, Creates new uh, opportunities, but you know I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm very bullish on Austin and and, and Texas. Uh, we love it here. All my family members are here. Hopefully, I can keep all my kids here. But if not, that's okay too, as long as they come back and visit me. Michael, thank you so much uh, for the time. I really appreciate it. I'd like to give the audience a chance to ask some questions via Slido. Hopefully, uh, there's some. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, first question from Jessica, Jessica Cassidy Katz. The Shalom Austin campus is such a treasure here. Can you speak a little bit about how you structure your charitable giving and how you think about your legacy? I uh, don't really think about my legacy. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm too young to think about my legacy. What do you think, Pat? I mean, <laughs> Who are you? I mean, we're around the same age, so yeah, I don't think yeah, about my legacy. Yeah, that's scary. I don't want to think about that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, 
you know, look, if, if you look at our foundation, um, we have focused on children and families in urban poverty generally, and that's had us focused on education, healthcare, family economic stability. Because we live in Austin, we've had a special focus in Austin. Yeah. And so we've, we've done some things in Austin that we wouldn't do in other cities. And, um, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, Austin has been kind of this, in this emergent stage where it is needed a lot of new things. And, you know, we've been able to, along with others, you know, help create those and catalyze those. And so that's, that's kind of how we think about it. But, but uh, the vast majority of what the foundation does is really around children in urban poverty. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's not all about Austin, right. but, but uh, you know, because we live here and it's our home, we, we do a lot more here than, than other places. I mean, and, as, and, it go, and it goes beyond those, those categories. I mean, as a side note, I mean, what I really love about your giving and the foundation is you don't trumpet it. You know, sometimes it just shows up and, and I mean, sure, there might be a press release, but, but you know, you're not, you know, doing the speaker circuit, talking about all the great things you've done and, and given away. And I, I think that, I think that's unique, Michael. I really think it is. So this is from Lala El Elizondo. I'm here with my nine-year-old boy, Jose. Ah. Hi there. <laughs> and he wants to ask, what life advice would you give to him and other nine-year-olds like him? Aww. Uh, learn as much as you can. Dream, dream big. Um, you know, don't be afraid to, to fail, make, make mistakes. And, uh, you know, uh, certainly when you're, when you're young, you want to you wanna, you wanna just... Uh, uh, have as many experiences and, and, and learnings as you possibly can to prepare yourself for the future. And, you know, when you find something you're interested in and curious about, uh, explore it. Um, you know, and uh, hopefully your parents will let you do it. I mean, you know, um, my mother was always very frustrated with me because she kind of wanted to decorate my room, you know, a certain way, and it always ended up looking like a lab laboratory or something, you know. <laughs> Uh, but she eventually figured out, okay, I'm just going to let Michael do Michael stuff. And, you know, it all worked out. So I love it. <laughs> no, I mean, I love that. Again, I usually the author will push their book. I, I loved your book because it talked so much about what you did as a kid uh, and how you got there. And that was a great question. Um, Here's a, here's a good question about kind of balancing uh, carbon emissions based on maybe what customers want. I mean, we're on track right now where, where data center power consumption, and this includes the hyperscalers, uh, is, is supposed to double. And, and that's coming from this insatiable demand for uh, GPUs and what customers want. How, how, how do you balance those two? Because it seems like consumers want more and more and more, but we're trying to... Um, get into a more sustainable posture too. Yes, so uh, there's a lot that we can do inside the actual you know, machines to make them way more energy efficient. And we've been doing that you know, at, at a pretty incredible scale. Uh, and so you know, on a like-for-like -like, uh, basis, if, if you sort of take out the, the, the factor that you know, these things are getting way more powerful, we've, we've been able to reduce the energy consumption like 80% uh, you know, it, you know, in, in, in every decade, and, which is pretty amazing. It doesn't get talked a lot about. No, it doesn't, but, but uh, the, you know, these systems are just way more energy efficient than they used to be. Now, if, if we sort of say, okay, wow, we have this computing power and this cognitive engine, and now we can go create RNA vaccines and we can you know, cure cancer, but it requires a lot of power, should we do that? Well, yeah, we, sh we should. Uh, and, and, and so you know, we have to accept that as civilization advances, it uses more power. At the same time, we have to make the systems more efficient and we have to find ways to use cleaner, greener, more renewable energy, you know, so that you know we don't we don't you know kind of burn up the whole planet. So 
we, like all companies, have tons of goals around that. And also, hey, energy costs have gone up a lot. And, but, but these new systems, when you, you know, go and do a traditional search, right, you know, with, with Google, uh, it uses a certain amount of computing power, a certain amount of electricity. But when you go and ask a complicated question, and you get back a super sophisticated answer, it's like a thousand times more power, right? Right. But you're not going to go back to doing it the old way when you get this really great answer just because, uh, you know, we don't want to use more power, right? You know, so we, we have to find ways to, to you know, uh, uh, deal with that. Yeah, one of the, the biggest things that we're looking at as an analyst firm is the use on more application-specific uh, uh, processors to do AI, AI inference. And I'm hopeful that the industry will start adopting it because they, you know, I'll say per token in generative AI language can be up to 10x less power than, than traditional technologies like a GPU that might train the model. And there's a ton of innovation in, in those ASICs, in the size of the models, in distilling the models, and you know, various caching techniques. And you know, uh, there's so much focus on, on, on this whole area in terms of how do you make these systems more efficient. And you know, uh, the pace of innovation we're seeing there is, is, you know, is really tremendous. So, um, but I'm, I'm confident we'll, you know, we'll continue to make a lot of progress there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, even on the client computing side, new technologies coming out. So uh, a question about, you know, first of all, Erica says she admires your attitude to continue creating new businesses in the tech industry. Uh, what motivates you to go that far and stay at the forefront of business? And, and I think maybe a side comment, not reading, reading the mind here, but given that you're so successful, like what keeps you going? You're, you're a builder and you keep, you keep building. Well, it's, it's fun, it's interesting, <laughs> and uh, it, I'd be bored if I wasn't able to do it, probably depressed too. So, you know, I, 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 I love it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm addicted to it in, in, in a way, right? <laughs> and, and, and look, I mean, when I see the impact that all this technology has on the world, that gets me incredibly excited, you know, to jump out of bed every morning and, you know, I feel like I'm doing the most important work that I can be doing. And so, yeah, if somebody said I couldn't do it, I'd be super sad. I love that. Um, so, uh, can you put it through Slido, please? Yeah, just uh, one, please. I'm not sure I have all the answers to that. Uh, you know, being good at one thing doesn't mean you're good at everything, right? So, true. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think I think there 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 definitely uh, needs to be a, a a big build out of data center capacity for sure. And you know, we're you know as when when we create these large systems and customers come to us, one of the challenges they have is hey, where's the data center capacity, you know? Sure. Uh, and it's a significant expense, time to, to build those out. I think, you know, uh, ultimately I think, I think uh, you know, the, the transmission lines, you know, have to be improved. There has to be more, uh, you know, capacity expansion and new energy sources to, you know, fuel, fuel all these systems. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be entrepreneurs, new companies, uh, certain regions of, of the country or the world that are going to create the circumstances that allow you know the, those data centers to, to be built. And I, and I know there are there are already you know lots of projects you know all over this country and around the world to build out that capacity. Um, and we could need a hundred times more sure. <laughs> you know, of, of this in 10 years than, than, than we have today. Nobody's, nobody's quite sure, but it's a lot more than we have right now. Totally. Let's move to uh, Kiara. Uh, how do you lead customers to adopt new behaviors and tools they didn't envision uh, or ask for, but you see as transformative uh, to their industry? That's a good question. Does Dell sell and create technology that people are asking for? Or is it ahead of the duck where you know customers so well and you understand ahead of the curve what they're going to want? It's, it's really both. Uh, and and uh, you know, th there's, there's always a, uh, an adoption curve, right? You've got certain leading customers that want those things before you have them and others that don't really know what they're going to do with them you know, until maybe they, they show up or they're just kind of slow, right, <laughs> to, sure. to, to adopt new things for whatever reason. Um, the good news is if you, if, you, if you have a big enough business, you have a lot, enough customers, you've got the early adopters um, and, you know, they can sort of demonstrate what the effectiveness of this is. If we go back to the AI example, you know, everybody's kind of mesmerized with the opportunity for Productivity and improvement, you know, productivity, efficiency improvements, and also reimagining their, their business. While there are definitely some that are sort of stunned, not really sure what to do, you know, they're looking over at the early adopters and say, well, if that works, I guess I better go do that. So um, rarely are we coming up with things that absolutely nobody you know, says they want. No, I like. I mean, like I said, Dell typically doesn't create things that people don't want to buy. Uh, but with that said, you it's know, like a good idea. No, no, it, oh. it's very good idea. <laughs> There's a lot of companies who will kind of throw something against the wall, invest a hundred million dollars, and nothing happens. You're not, you don't, you don't play that. We, game. we, you know, we. I mean, look, we have, we have, we've invested over thirty billion dollars in R and D in the last decade. We have over thirty thousand patents. We have a incredible team of, uh, you know, scientists, engineers, developers, and, and we have advanced teams that are going off and creating things that aren't really on the product roadmap yet because we have to investigate and understand how these things are going to affect. We build prototypes and, you know, sort of uh, experiment with all, all kinds of new things before they're really ready to, to be products. It's a great segue to this ne next question from uh, Marcelo, who asks, how do you know when to persist on an idea or when to give up, right? How do we differentiate resilience from stubbornness? And, you know, in your history, <laughs> you've been in some businesses, got out of a business, got back into businesses uh, for right timing and a different, uh, different approach. It's a great question. Yeah, how do you know when to uh, fold them? Fold um, them or fold them? Yeah, uh, I mean... A lot of it is gut feel, intuition, and you, you don't necessarily have to completely, you know, shut something down. You, you might you might put it in more of a, of a, uh, you know, maintenance or, uh, you know, just invest less, right, in, in, in something if if the if if it might be, you know, a year or two premature, but you just have to look at each situation and and uh, use your best judgment and. Sometimes you'll get it right, sometimes you'll get it wrong. I'm really glad that notice he didn't give the spreadsheet answer. I mean, obviously there are spreadsheets behind decisions, but there's a lot of intuition and experience that, that goes into these very uh, important decisions. So here's a kind of a personal slash business question. What's the best technology you use daily in your home and office? And I. I just guess that some of it is Dell branded. 
Yeah, I'm loving, I'm loving our new 40-inch displays, Pat. Is that the curved you know? display? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, uh, the number of pixels and the, the resolution, I mean, you, you, you got to have at least one or two of those. Um, Everybody hear that? <laughs> And, 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 and I mean, it, it sounds like a simple thing, but you know, if you kind of compare the experience from, from, from a user standpoint, in terms of your productivity and what you can do, I love, I, love, I love the big displays. And that, you know, we still consume so much more information visually than, you know, with any other sense, uh, you know, the displays continue to get better and faster all the time. Uh, I own three Dell ultra-wide monitors, and so I'm a fan, and no, those weren't ones that I was sampled, ones that I got on Dell.com. And, and I, I just got the, you know, we just got the new XPS 16 with the Meteor Lake processor with the NPU, so I can run some of the AI workloads, and, you know, it's got the OLED display, incredible brightness, you know, super thin, super light. Um, you know, I don't mind carrying a little extra weight to have a 16-inch display because it's like you've got a workstation with you wherever you go, and I like that. I'm going to look into this. You really are still a product person, aren't you? Yeah, it's, I, I spend, spend, spend a lot of time with, 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 with our product teams. That is, is still a very, very fun part of what, you know, uh, I get to do and spending time with customers. I love that, and you're not above it. I mean, you, you might have, a lot of people might, you know, start in the garage, or I guess with you, it was uh, in, your, in one of your rental homes in college, <laughs> where you were stacking up boxes and opening, and you had soldering irons, putting BIOS in and out. But uh, yeah, a lot of people, they, they lose that as they get into other things, and I, I think that's important, and I, I look at other kind of founder CEOs, they all seem to be very close to uh, the product. I think that's good to see. So uh, let's move into the final question. This is gonna be the last question here from Lucy. How does having artists and musicians in Austin help our city's innovation? Yeah, I mean, uh, Austin's always, been a great city for, for, from that standpoint because it's it's had a it's had a great you know sort of eclectic mix of, of people, and uh, it, it's it, it's definitely I think what makes the city great gives gives it a lot of its culture and character, um, and you know I love I love you know uh, all all the aspects of Austin, uh, the live music, uh, and you know again. University is a great wellspring for all that. There's a lot of hippies that are still here. Uh, you know, help help me keep this, the city beautiful, and protecting the the open spaces and the and the parks. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's all all great. Having moved into the mid, the Midwest, where I'm sure we had creative people in Cleveland, Ohio, maybe the orchestra, but coming here, it, it just does have a different vibe and. You know, my lens of innovation happens to be through technology and, you know, the, the triangle of, of music, movies, and technology is strong here. I see a we, lot of... We have, we, have, we have fantastic internal bands, right? Yeah. There's a lot of software developers, programmers, they're musicians, right? And so, you know, the battle of the bands at Dell Technologies is, is something pretty amazing. So Michael, I just want to thank you so much. Let's give Michael a round of applause here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you.